great pleasure to be able to introduce uh, Dr. Catherine Waddington, who's coming from the University of Westminster. Uh, Catherine is a chartered psychologist. She's a principal fellow of the Higher Education Academy or Advanced HE, whatever they call themselves now. And she's also a reader in work and organizational psychology, yes, I'm getting that right, at yep. the University of Westminster. She's recently edited a book on compassion in higher education. Mm -hmm. It's there, lovely. And she's going to be talking today about creating compassionate universities. So without further ado, lovely. Is all thank, yours. You. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Um, so it's lovely to be here. You'll hear a little bit more about me as the session goes on. Um, but Melissa's given a nice kind of potted history. And very quickly, I don't suppose, is there anybody here from psychology? Yes, no? And anybody from the business school. And that's absolutely fine, but you, you'll find out why I asked that um, in a little while. I'm not here to sell the book, but I'm going to take some extracts from it. And it's really nice to do this face to face rather than doing it on Teams uh, from my very messy study bedroom. Um, so I'll be reading a few little bits, um, but it is important to say that all of the royalties for this, it's an edited book, and it's got chapters by some colleagues from Westminster and also externally. Um, and all of the royalties go to the charity Student Minds. Um, so if your library hasn't got one, then please could somebody make sure that they do. Um, it's hardback, which is expensive because that's what publishing is. And that's for libraries with a big budget. Um, but it's also available as an ebook. And really, I think what I want to do is start by asking the question, what might a compassionate university look like um, and you know how might we want our universities to be better what might a compassionate university feel like to work in um, and often i'm asked that and for me it's also just looking around the place does the place look cared for do people look content they might look a bit stressed but do they look content are they smiling or are they <clears throat> So it's what does it look like? What might it feel like? And the reason we've, I've chosen this one, this, this is an amalgam of slides that a number of us have done from the book, um, is I tell stories. And so get used to it. You learn a lot about me and my family in the next 40 minutes. Uh, my daughter, Hannah, um, has a little dog called Billy and I'm retiring next year. So I'm phasing out my hours. So Mondays and Tuesdays are my dog duty days. Um, and he's a pets as therapy volunteer. So some universities have pets as therapy dogs that go in um, or are happy for you know students to take their own dogs in um, in relation to managing stress and well-being. So that's just a bit of a plug for pets as therapy. Good, excellent. So how did it all start? It started 30 years ago um, at UEL um, at the Stratford campus when I did an MSc in Occupational and Organisational Psychology. I'd just started working in a what was then a bit like UEL, a polytechnic that was making the transition to becoming a new university. So I was I did it part time between 1990 and 1992. So I was data collecting. Um, looking at research for my kind of project research into perceptions of organisational culture as not UEL, but as another polytechnic was making the transition. Um, and that's really where it all started from. And unbelievably, oh, remember these, this is my dissertation. And it's got one of those dot matrix printer things that used to make such a clatter. Um, and I'll share a few little bits from that maybe as we go through. So I was looking at uh, using Edgar Schein's theoretical model, which I'm going to put up a slide in a minute, um, of organisational culture. So that's why I was interested. Was there anybody here from psychology or the business school who might have known a little bit about this? Um, but I think it's important for universities like UEL to know where their alumna go. So when I reflect um, as a reflexive researcher and reflective practitioner, it was lovely to think about preparing this and thinking, gosh, Yes, it was 30 years ago. I was just pregnant. And now I look after my daughter's dog on a Monday and a Tuesday. Ooh. Um, and I would never have known 30 years ago that what I was doing for my dissertation research would have got me to where I am now. So um, the data collection in my um, research 
because I'd just come from working clinically into a polytechnic that was making the transition. And in my clinical role, I was in a clinical education role in healthcare, coming from a background in nursing. And I just found that the, my, my experience of this new culture, this new university culture, was so different from what I'd been used to. And I wanted to know more about why things were done the way they were in that particular um, higher education context. And that led to my PhD, which was about the characteristics of organisational gossip in nursing as an occupation and healthcare as organisations. Um, what I've learned over time is if you don't sell yourself and you don't say if you're not your own PR person, then nobody else will know. But it actually led to a single authored monograph, um, which is still up there on the Routledge website, and a, and a forthcoming book that was commissioned by Routledge in what they call state of the art in business research which I find quite ironic because I've never worked in a business school, um, but where my MSc data from UEL in occupational and organisational psychology took me was to a field of research that is now seen as state of the art, up and coming, um, a really hot, sexy topic. So who would have thought? Um, so that's just a bit of a plug for the book. Um, and that's also, I guess, where my thinking about compassion really began, although I didn't know it at the time, about what should compassionate university cultures look like. So this is Edgar Schein's model, and it's thinking about three levels of culture. You've got the stuff on the outside. I had a quick look at your website before I came today, and you've changed your logo, and this is the place where change happens. So all the bits that are out there, what does that say about the espoused values and strategies of a university um, and often the espoused values are not necessarily the same as the hidden underlying values hence the bit about you know reality versus rhetoric so let me just uh, 30 years ago when it wasn't here but this is um, what people were saying in relation to um, the reality piece it's, um, I think it's a fairyland, a sort of myth come reality. Yesterday was reality, today is the myth. Then you think again and yesterday becomes the myth and today the reality. Does this resonate with anybody? I often wonder if in a real world, when I hear some of the things going on around me, my, my question is how, how much have things changed? Have they changed for the better? Um, this is where my thinking around gossip came from. Um, oh, did you know that so-and-so has been paid off? They got 10,000. Lots of rumours, lots of stories. That's what got me thinking about gossip. Um, another bit here. Um, there's a sense from the grassroots, very in mind 30 years ago, there's a very bureaucratic hierarchical structure being developed. Um, another one here. Where's, where's this one? Yeah, I... The idea that the poly can be run like a business is wrong, and it's been inflicted upon us and it cuts across all educational values that we've had. So I'm probably going to relook at this from a critically reflexive point of view and ask myself what has really changed, what has got better and what's got worse. And so the things that I liked and when I was doing my research and I still like is looking at what some of the, the basic assumptions, a really Edgar Schein classic question to ask is what gets rewarded around here? Uh, and often what gets rewarded isn't always the same as what's espoused as a value. Um, what's the biggest mistake somebody could make around here? Why are things done the way they are around here? And when we work in an organisation for a long time, things that you, when, when you first start, you think, why do they do that? Or how many times, you, well, in my old organisation, we used to. But after about six months, you become enculturated. Um, so the, the thing that really got me interested in gossip was when I said, why are things done the way they are around here? And a quite a senior academic said, and I had a tape recorder that was about this big, it was huge. And he switched that off and he had a roll up cigarette because people used to smoke and he just rolled it up. And if he was going to be played by an actor, he would be played by Bill Nighy. Very, very long, very slim, kind of hair like that. And I remember it really well. I couldn't use it as data because it was off the switch, that thing off. I can use it as a story. And he, 
put the smoke out the window and he said, OK, I'll tell you why, which I couldn't use. But as a newcomer in the organisation, I had this real penny dropping. Ah, so that's why that head of department doesn't like that one. That's why it's been so difficult for me and the person who started with me to find an office. There was like turf wars going on. And that's just really, really inspired and interested me. So thinking about the use of metaphor, So just, just off the top of your head, um, if not, not, not so much UEL, but universities in the 21st century, if they were something else, anything, what would they be? That lady there's nodding. Does anything come to mind? No, sorry, I was just nodding at your um, kind of question, but I, I, yeah, I don't have anything. Does any, anybody yeah. just top of the head come to mind? Yes, Prison. <laughs> okay. What kind, and so this is a classic occupational psychology technique of using metaphor to get at the underlying. Okay. What kind of a prison? I was actually thinking of the panoptic and. Okay. Yeah, the old Foucault stuff. And why? Because we're surveyed constantly. Um, and like you, I was in at the beginning of UEL um, when it was just well, it had just transitioned. I worked in, somewhere else for a few mm. years, but I think we were probably similar age. And um, I felt increasingly over the years that the added surveillance and the um, constant monitoring do nothing to um, foster um, an atmosphere in which real learning can mm -hmm. take place. Yep, thank you. Let's have one more. Anybody else got an image that pops into their head as to, you know, your, if, 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 if 20, 21st century, so I don't necessarily want to personalise it to UEL, was something else. We've had prison. Anybody else got anything in, in their head? Yeah, what's yours? Well, there's Heath Robinson machines. A Heath Robinson machine. Can you describe a little bit more about that? What you mean by that? Thing, because we've become more and more complicated, the output is often relatively simple, but we have incredibly complex processes and methods, yeah. you know, so that there's machines that make a cup of tea, but they take up the whole room. Yeah, that, that kind yeah. of. Yeah, yeah. And that, that's the overcomplicating things, the bureaucracy, the increasing bureaucracy. Well, and um, also that it appears to have grown bit yeah. by bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the reason kind of coming closer to about creating compassionate universities You'll see when I get to the end, it really is a hot topic, um, not least of all the book towards the compassionate university. I'm not the you know, there are other brands, there are other people who write about compassion in higher education. Um, but it's just really important to think about how your experiences in. So this is just the thought piece, the reflection piece, match up to the institutional values and strategies and what's behind all of them. So that's just a point, I guess, for reflection. So what I'm going to do is give you an overview of some of the chapters, not every single one. There's about 13 chapters in the book. Um, why compassion and why now? Uh, what Charles Darwin, um, who is often seen as the, the person who really, he talked about it in terms of sympathy, but compassion as an evolved emotion. And there's lots of other ways of thinking about it. Um, really, really did some fundamental thinking about compassion. Um, Self-compassion for me, if I want one kind of take home message to deliver, is you can't have any sort of institutional compassion unless you think about yourself and unless you have self-compassion. Um, as our university at Westminster has compassion as one of its three core values, the others are um, responsible, sepia and progressive. And so for me, working in the university, and I've been there for eight years, as an organisational psychologist, what does that mean? What does that value look like? Because if it's just glossy words on a glossy brochure on a very sophisticated website that costs the university a fortune, but if it doesn't translate into day to day practice, what it feels like when you're walking through the door, then it's just, you know, rhetoric. Um, uh, thinking about compassion, there's going to be a bit in there about higher education policy and some concluding remarks and opportunities for questions. So really, the core issue is, are we facing a compassion turn in universities? Is what's really kind of coming up in a bit of a kind of small ripples and building into a tidal wave? Is that a good thing um, or is it just the new buzzword? Is it just the new flavour of the month? 
in response to neoliberal harm. Because essentially that's what's behind the need for compassion in universities. So the first chapter, which is a chapter as editor that I wrote, is why compassion and why now? So you can see this, this hopefully you'll all be able to relate to, the international backdrop of 30 years plus of neoliberal ideology and higher education policy, the need for ment mentally healthy universities, both for staff and students. So I don't know whether your university signed up the um, Student Minds Mental Health Charter. Universities UK are doing a lot about creating mentally healthy universities at a whole systems level. Uh, and the things that we know, and I'm sure it's the same for you, um, students with quite complex mental health needs. If you look back to maybe student populations, those have been around you know, a bit of a time. Um, and compassion is about noticing suffering. Um, the, the word compassion means to suffer with, from the Latin to suffer with. Um, so it's about noticing. But in actually to notice something, you've got to know what it looks like and what it feels like. So what I often say here is I've got a really good friend that I used to work with. She's called Hannah, Hannah Lee. She's Finnish. And when I spent time in Finland with her and we go into the woods um, and pick berries and all the things that you get in Finland, it's an amazing country. And there are mushrooms. You have to know which are the mushrooms you can pick and which are the mushrooms that are really poisonous. So therefore, you have to know what suffering looks like, because it's like with a mushroom. If you don't know what it looks like, and you pick one, and it's the wrong one, and you haven't noticed, then you, you have to know what you're looking for to be able to notice it. Um, it's about feeling empathy, but it's more than that. It's really important. It's then about taking action. So compassion without action is kind words. Kind words are great, but they only get you so far. So action is really, really important. Um, but one of the things I'm doing at the moment with a colleague um, is if you think about education and learning and the student experience or student experiences, students may not necessarily want to be cast as sufferers. For me, the whole marketization of higher education is students are not consumers or customers. They're learners with power and we have to help them use their power. Um, so we're doing a small piece of work at the moment, looking at compassion through student lenses. What does a compassionate classroom look like and feel like for students? Um, and we're also looking at the point of view of thinking about recognising and noticing difference, discrimination and bias, which goes beyond Black Lives Matter, but it really kind of reinforces and speaks to that. Um, and also thinking about developing compassionate intersectional pedagogy. Um, and action learning as a vehicle for compassion. One of the quotes I was looking there, I can't personally find it, was 30 years ago, I interviewed a black academic who'd just come into the university. And she said she was really surprised at the experiences of racism and sexism that her students were, black students were, were talking about 30 years ago. And we still have got the same issues. Um, and action learning as a vehicle for compassion, which is one of the chapters in the book, because action learning actually really set this book off. One of my, um, I was facilitating the action learning group, and one of my actions was to develop a book proposal for what became Towards the Compassionate University. So that's a bit of the kind of background and history. Right, who have we got coming up next? Okay, so Dermot uh, worked in a business school at Sheffield University. He's moved to France now. So there's nobody from the business school, but just see this. This was how he started his chapter. So there's a bit of a kind of listen with mother kind of thing going on here. Um, and tell me if any of it resonates with your disciplines. Shortly after I entered academia following a career in engineering, I met with a senior colleague at my institution whose cynical and instrumental view of the profession, this was in management, made me question the career switch that I'd made. Amongst the many nuggets of wisdom he imparted, was the core belief that research alone and above all publication in high ranked journals was the only thing that mattered in the 21st century university. He strongly advised me not to waste time on any other activity unless it could demonstrably help achieve his goal. This included time wasting activities such as reviewing papers, attending colleagues research seminars um, and writing book chapters. Does that resonate with any you're nodding Gabriella? Can you can you give us a quick example? 
is the kind of thing you hear that teaching can get subordinated um, a lot and uh, a lot of the advice early career academics get similar to that. Yeah, yeah. And, and there's a fantastic, it's referenced in here, that there's a fantastic chapter in a book about neoliberal you know, universities and feminist approaches called Help, I'm an early career feminist academic, get me out of here. So that that kind of resonates that resonates with that. So um, Darwin, um, a lot of Darwin's thinking has been misrepresented. He was probably in the Victorian age the first person who was victim to disinformation because he never said evolution is about the survival of the fittest. He never ever said that, but that was misappropriated by somebody called Spencer, I think it was. Um, whereas in fact Darwin said. Um, it's not the strongest that survives, nor the most intelligent. So there's a lot for us to learn in higher education. It's the one that's most adaptable to change, lives within the means available and works cooperatively against common threats. So all of these things, you know, the, the threats and threat implies harm and harm implies suffering is behind what we're talking about here. So um, Dermot's chapter is he doesn't actually specifically mention the ref but it's the subtext of the ref. So what Dermot's conclusion is, uh, a rebalance between individuals. So a lot of the stuff that's around ref um, and the gamesmanship that goes on in the research world, in, in particularly research intensive universities, um, rebalancing between individual towards more collaborative and group uh, levels of selection. Um, and that needs altruism, compassion and social cohesion replacing instrumental self-serving norms. So his chapter in particular, it's chapter three, is very much about the, the kind of competitive research environment. And we'll come to teaching as well shortly. Um, another chapter that's really uh, important is by a colleague, Jenny Nolan, who works in our business school, in Westminster Business School. And she's just finishing doing a her professional doctorate around uh, mindfulness and self-compassion and so her chapter is about befriending ourselves self-compassion and one of the things that we talked about in our action learning set we used imagery quite a lot so this is one of the images used with permission I don't know what any of you know know of any of Anthony Gormley's statues really famous ones on Crosby Beach up in the northwest in London he had some that were on the top of the festival hall but they had to be taken that they're, they're cast iron um, statues of himself um, standing on the top of the festival hall and people going over Waterloo Bridge thought there were people going to jump off so those that were on the top of the festival hall had to be taken off this one's on Margate Beach and essentially at the sea it comes in and it covers the statues over completely but because it's made of cast iron it goes out again and the statue is still there so for Jenny writing her chapter that was a really important image around developing resilience um, particularly in terms of the pressures of university life and particularly in terms of the times when we know it's going to be really, really busy. Um, when that big tide comes in at the beginning of the term, at the beginning of the, you know, the new academic year, marking, all that kind of thing. So that element of you need to be able to weather the storm and develop resilience. And so for Jenny, and linked to her research, self-compassion is self-kindness. This is somebody called mainly Kristen Neff who's done this um, versus self-judgment. And there's great research out there with students in relation. If students can develop self skills of self-compassion rather than self-criticism, they do better in their coursework. And I can send Melissa some you know, research in relation to that. Common humanity um, rather than uh, isolation. And my preference is shared humanity. But by way of an example, I think this is a really powerful example. One of the things that we did at Westminster in psychology a couple of years ago was we developed a, in inverted commas, reverse mentoring project where some of our undergraduate psychology students and recent graduates um, were mentors. They weren't mentored. They were the mentors to our universe, members of our university executive board. And for one of the pairings, how they really developed that kind of mentoring relationship between a young black Berger psychology student and a very senior white male person in the university um, was to, to develop this notion of, of their shared humanity 
was they shared their experiences of a close family bereavement because that's what they've both recently been through. And that really, really helped. Um, and the other one is about mindfulness over identification, um, thinking about just, just being aware of what's going on around us. And if we're then noticing suffering, noticing um, difference, noticing discrimination, actually doing something about it. And there's a, I say, I've sent Melissa these slides, so some resources that Jenny puts up for that, um, self-compassion scales, exercises around self-compassion. Okay, the other one that we've got here is Franz Pedersen. And if he was here, he'd tell me off because I've spelled his name wrong because he's from Denmark, not Sweden. So it should be Pedersen, but that was me doing my slides this morning, being a bit last minute. Um, and Franz works in our um, international politics. And he also works within our, we have a Centre for Excellence in Teaching, Centre for Education and Teaching Innovation. Um, so his chapter is an, compassion as an antidote to neoliberal higher education policies in England and also how it extends out globally. And, and if um, Franz was here, A, he'd spell his name right, um, but he'd show and share maybe um, a couple of his photographs. So these, these are photographs that Franz has taken, and this is what compassion means to him, which is, so he took this um, on an evening walk last year, I think it was, which is, you can think about the ripples, and the ripples of compassion, in a positive sense, can actually keep you afloat, when underneath you're going like that. So it's about compassion can keep you afloat, but also if, if ripples of compassion in a positive way begin to swell into a tide, then maybe that's the antidote to neoliberal higher education policies. Another picture that he put in was this one, which is about how compassion is, is actually a shining light um, illuminating in times when things either individually or institutionally feel really dark. You're looking really kind of like, ooh. Um, so this is what compassion, so something that you might want to take away and think about, is what does compassion mean to you? what images pop up into your mind when you're thinking about compassion and why. Um, so what Franz says, which I think hopefully people in this room can really, um, I've, got his, I've got his name right there, is are we forgetting? So these are more points for reflection. Um, and I'm going to leave some time when I finish so we can have some general discussion. So a really important question. Are we forgetting the intrinsic value of education now that we've got students that are recast as consumers um, and the kind of marketization of higher education, have we really forgotten about what the intrinsic value of education is? Which is why the research I'm doing with somebody called Brian Bonaparte is what does compassion look like through a student lens? Because we would hope that when students come to us to study psychology at Westminster, even though it might be a stressful experience, it's ultimately an empowering and life-changing and positive experience so you know what are the intrinsic values and different disciplines might have different, different individuals might have different values um are we forgetting the transformational effect of education and so so franz's chapter about compassion as an antidote you know an antidote is something if you get bitten by a snake then that's what you have to stop you you know asphyxiating or whatever um can it be an antidote to the toxic effects of neoliberal um, higher education policy. So that's a really powerful, uh, really powerful thing. Where am I now? So I've only got three slides left and then we can open it up for discussion. Okay, so creating compassionate universities, hopefully rather than it being a rhetoric, what does it really look like? So it's about being reflective. And for me, a really important message is thinking about Compassion is everybody's business in a university. Um, we've been doing some work around compassionate pedagogy, which I'm going to come back to in a minute. Um, and one of the things that we've done at Westminster through our Centre for Education and Teaching Innovation is we've set up a number of effectively learning communities, communities of practice. And one of them was compassionate pedagogy. And the outcome of that group of people um, was this book, and the research that we're doing, a small research grant. But actually thinking about compassionate pedagogy, 
and, and students and staff experiences in, of learning and teaching in a university cuts across everything. For example, the, the minute that you walk through the door, do you feel welcomed? I used to work somewhere else. And, and that's when I'm, I'm always particularly interested in just looking at what's around me. Um, and one member of staff said, you know, when we, when we come in here, it's all big red. It's like going through um, customs and security at Heathrow. Students not allowed, no entry. You know, what does that say about a kind of welcoming environment? And it's more the kind of tone of things um, in terms of how things are communicated. A lot of conversations I've had with people are sometimes this organisational systems and IT systems and registry systems aren't very compassionate at all. You know, you know you've only got to look at um, if a student needs mitigating circumstances and just the hoops that they have to go through. And if you're feeling, if you had a bereavement or you're, you're so stressed that your mental health is adversely affected. Um, and I'll give you one little example. When I was, um, and I'm not going to personalise this, but I'm just going to use it as an example from my own experience. Um, I was supervising when I was head of department, I was supervising a student who was doing her undergraduate project and she negotiated with permission and all the right stuff to do some data collection in a, I think it was in a school. And then all of a sudden um, she came to see me and she said the head teacher's really sorry, but they've got an unexpected Ofsted um, inspection coming next week. And again, you're nodding and, and, you know, and they're really apologetic. It was unexpected. It was one of those spot checks. And we really can't have an, an undergraduate psychology student collecting data because everybody is so stressed they won't have time to do the interviews. So she had to rethink what she was doing. So she put in mitigating circumstances. And I had, a, I had a copy of the letter and the email that the head of the school had sent to her, which she'd sent to me. Um, and, and I said, just send that on and I'll send an email of support for your mitigating circumstances to get, um, to get an extension on your final year project. And it was rejected because the policy says you need to have a copy of the letter, a physical hard copy of the letter. This was about four or five years ago. Um, and I said, but you sent a copy of the letter that's on headed paper from the school and I'm head of psychology and I've sent an email saying I fully support. But sometimes just the way that people can just just kind of interpret things. And I was in a conversation yesterday with something that I'm going to give you the link to. Uh, Exeter University are putting on a, a 10 day festival of compassion and I'll be doing a panel discussion next Thursday. And we were just talking that the planning for that next week. So what they're doing at Exeter is trying to be have a really light touch in terms of mitigating circumstances. And again, I don't know about your experience, but I, you know, students who've had a bereavement um, and the hoops they have to go through in a different country to get a copy of the death certificate. But until that's there, and the fact that you can't, you know, you've got a grieving student, isn't that enough evidence? Um, and I, and it is that bit about building trust. It really is about building trust. So um, everyone has a role to play, and, and that includes our organisational systems. We all need to be reflective and learn from experience. And that was when our reverse mentoring scheme was really helpful because it helped some of our really senior academics. Um, I've, I've yet to kind of write up the final report, but somebody again in a very senior position said, I had no idea how much it cost our international students at graduation when their family come from wherever. I had no idea how much it cost and how much students and their families paid for graduation. So that was a really important reflective point for that person. Um, active, compassion without action is just kind words. Kind words are fine, but they can only get you so far. Uh, collaborative, that links back to the Darwin piece and working collaboratively with other people. Um, and Dermot's view that we need to move away from kind of individual to group levels of, of collaborative working. Um, we need to be humane. We need to think about that's our shared humanity. Um, compassion cannot exist without humanity. So that, that's really important reflective questions to ask. Is this a humane decision? Where's the humanity in this? And hopeful. Um, Paolo Freire talked about, he used the term hope without illusion which is about realistic hope, because one of the concerns that I've got is that with compassion, particularly this fantastic group that I'm part of that's called Compassion in Politics, which is a cross-party um, kind of pressure group, 
So just Google them. And it only costs four pounds a month to be a member, and they do some fantastic things. Um, and I'm now I'm just really tuned in to the way that either politicians are then described as being compassionate. You won't be surprised, but I won't say which last year, I think it was, um, which particular um, broadsheet newspaper described Boris Johnson as one of the most compassionate prime ministers we're likely to see. Showing my politics, obviously. Um, but it's really important that, that, it, that compassion is realistic. It's not just bolted on. It's not just, well, I'll have a side order of compassion with that because I've actually got quite a, a hard message to get across. Um, and there's also what's called conspicuous compassion. So the minute we have a compassion excellence framework, we've lost the plot, but we have to think about why are people being compassionate? Is it because they genuinely feel that they want to alleviate somebody's suffering or distress or stress? Or is it so that they're going to get a nice thing to put on the wall that says, you know, you know, the, the minute the minute human resources departments do an annual compassion audit, I think my view is we've lost the plot. So, but we need to cultivate hope without illusion, rather than compassion being seen as this kind of pink and fluffy and thinking it's going to make everything all right, when actually what's underneath it isn't necessarily all right. So, nearly finished. We're ready for some questions. Okay, so what's coming next? Um, for me, um, there's a paper coming out next month from a journal that's called European Work and Organisational Psychology in Practice, but it's widely relevant. And again, I can send it to the link to Melissa when it comes out. Um, anybody from psychology or the business school would probably be aware of the European Association for Work and Organisational Psychology. Um, but it's a case study of our action learning set that came up with this and a case study of compassion in action. Um, the University of Exeter are doing a compassion festival. The slightly cynical bit of me thinks festivals are all the rage at the moment in universities. It's something that's kind of like, wow. So, but they, what they're doing is really good. Um, so they're doing a 10 day festival with a whole range of things. Some of them are very much linked to the, the city of Exeter. A lot are online, a lot of things that you can access via the website. Next Thursday at um, 9.30 to 12 o'clock, there's going to be a panel discussion of keynotes of which I've been invited, which is great. But th and to think about sharing experiences. Um, so I'll just read you a little bit from this. Universities today can seem to generate more stress and competition than knowledge. Um, sharing theories and best practices. And the session next Thursday is going to be actually very practical. So how can we do something about this? Um, the panel will reflect on themes like organisational values, which goes back to the culture piece, the Oakeshine pub culture piece, communities, learning, teaching quality and assessment, and how to achieve a more human or humane university experience. Um, and it's addressing the following three questions, which I think are really important. Um, and you can find these when, if you wanted to link on the, um, the Eventbrite link. How can we make sure that more traditional facets of an academic institution overlay compassion and inclusion? Is it about embedding and underpinning or something else? For me, it's about infusing. Uh, maybe that's just me going back to my way back in the day when I used to be a nurse. And, you know, you, you, if you're dehydrated, you need an intravenous infusion. If you're lacking compassion, you need an infusion of compassion that cuts across all levels. Um, how can we foster trust? And that's really, really important. Um, so that we as a learning community can move forwards together in a meaningful way. And from the leadership point of view, I think that's also about recognising vulnerabilities. Do you know what? We didn't get that right, rather than trying to cover it up. And what needs to move structurally to allow vulnerability and humility to emerge um, as compassionate guiders, drivers, enablers. So there's going to be some fantastic stuff going on there. Um, the, if anybody was from psychology, I'm going to be um, lead editor for a special issue um, uh, of the journal called Frontiers in Psychology, but it's going to be an interdisciplinary call and Frontiers as a journal have got, I think they've got about over 40 titles and within each of those there's subsections. Um, and that's going to be really good. The only warning is that um, Frontiers is a gold open access publication and charges apply um, and they are expensive they're just short of three thousand dollars 
for a 18,000 word kind of really big empirical paper and even shorter um, sort of mini literature reviews, systematic reviews and um, mini reports on empirical research come in at about $1,800. So one of the things that I'm doing with our university is lobbying the vice chancellor to say from the early career researcher point, academic point of view, we've got some PhD students who've done some fantastic work that's compassion related. They can't afford that. But if you've got, a, you, you know, what he calls his funny money um, and we do a business case. And so he's agreed in principle to make a 6,000 word um, fund available so that we can encourage um, some of our early career researchers and PhD students. So because it, 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 that, that's a good way of you know getting your foot on the ladder. And also, I'm currently developing a, developing a proposal for a book called Developing Compassionate Pedagogy, Research, Theory and Practice that will go to the Society for Research in Higher Education and Routledge um, editorial team. So my final slide, and um, for anybody to get in touch with me in conclusion, and then we have five minutes for questions, is um, poetry, literature, one of the things we these are all things that can help us key into compassion so um th this this particular poem that was written by a student in the us that's in the book all lives don't matter if black lives don't same-sex couples can build up a home women want equal pay in addition to votes that's freedom to us so this is about seeing it through student eyes um and it gives me some hope um this is about this reminder all the things go to the charity student minds and it's on, available on Amazon and there's an ebook. And if anybody's got any ideas for an article for Frontiers, and particularly if you can mind, try and get some funding um, to support you, um, and different institutions do it in different ways, um, and there's often a pot of money, but it's not very much for a whole university or a whole faculty, um, or an idea for a chapter for the book proposal, because I'll be looking to maybe have between 15 and 18 chapters, then please get in touch. But that's all for me at the moment. So thank you. And if you've got any questions, I'll be happy to take. Maybe if people want to do, can stay on for a little bit longer. Um, I can stay on for a little bit longer after two o'clock. Thank you. Hi, I'm Robert. Um, so all sounds great. What's holding universities, you know, the the, the senior people back from doing something about it? Um, I think it's the kind of hard nosed bit. I think it's two things. One is the view that compassion is a bit pink and fluffy and it's a bit soft and it's a bit. Um, Frank Ferrudi, the sociologist, is very critical of this particular approach. But I saw him um, described as a predator predatory sociologist, which was quite interesting. Um, so there is this view that universities need to be more businesslike and they need to be ruthless and compassion's got no place. And there's a real challenge there because we have to think about with, you know, what you were saying, Gabriella, it is a cutthroat world out there. It is, you know, I'm an early career feminist academic, get me out of here. Um, so some of the conversations that I have with colleagues is how do we get the right balance between giving people the resilient skills to survive in this hostile environment, while also hopefully kind of making some little making some little ripples. So I think, and the other thing is, is that I'll give you a concrete example. I was talking to a vice chancellor in a university outside of London, who was really championing compassion in in their vice chancellor role, and they said, and this is a gossipy bit that did this lovely you know, keynote and what have you, and overheard somebody going out the door saying, well, we've got an optimist in the room um, and really disparaging. So I think there's also that, which is why it's got to be called out in relation to, is this a compassionate decision? Because when I talk about compassion in my own university, and people often say, but that's all well and good, Catherine. Psychology as a discipline um, and, and grouping is seen as compassionate. And my view is, well, if psychologists can't be compassionate, then we shouldn't be in psychology. But that can be compared with some other disciplines that might be seen to be a bit more hard nosed where compassion doesn't really seem to, to feature. Um, and I think the answer to that cynicism, which is the answer to your question, is just 
look at the evidence base for compassion, look at the good empirical work that's coming out, particularly in the business world in relation to compassion um, and the bottom line. And if you can show a business, you know, return on investment for compassion, you have to use the language at that level. I hope that answers your question. What is that empirical work that you return to? There's a, there's a lot um, in relation to, so I'm just thinking this is more in the business world. So um, I, think, it, I forget which business school it is, um, and it will come to me, but they've done some really interesting work in relation to what are the constituent components of compassion. Um, and again, I can, send, I can send you a link. I've got a table which is the evidence base for compassion and where it comes from. And also within the NHS, I'll maybe this from the final comment, and then maybe have another couple of questions, is what really got me interested in compassion was, oh gosh, five, five six years ago now, I was at a workshop um, held by our Centre for Resilience at Westminster for clinicians in the NHS and practitioners in the NHS that was called Closing the Compassion Gap in the NHS, which had arisen all the mid-Staffordshire inquiries and all of the tragedies and, you know, the, the horrible stuff that was going on and the scandals. And I just, as I was listening to that, made me realise that thinking over time, it's no wonder there's a compassion gap in the NHS because students who leave universities where they've studied nursing or medicine or allied health professions or they've gone to a university to do further study aren't always that compassionate. Um, and that really got me thinking about, I wrote a paper that was called The Compassion Gap in UK Universities. The language that we use, students are excluded, terminated. Um, I, I was in a a quite a senior level meeting and a registrar said so what are we going to do about students on obsolete courses and I went is that the right word to use do you think how, how do you think our students might feel if they know that the course they're doing and they haven't finished it the university thinks it's obsolete and, and another senior person said oh Catherine don't be ridiculous um they're never going to see the, the the minutes of this meeting and I said but it'll filter through you know if, if, if people's courses are seen as obsolete then some way, shape or form, it might, you know, filter through to the student experience. So that just got me really listening to that. And when I had conversations with them, they'd say, oh, yeah, I was in a meeting and students were just referred as numbers, numbers on a spreadsheet rather than the humanity. Um, so it's, it's about changing those things. Any, any other last questions? Yeah. Make a comment. I'm just on my way out the door. I'm yeah, supposed yeah, yeah. to be in a meeting as usual. Um, but it, it's about, um, I mean, thank you for the paper, Catherine, by the way, um, which I really enjoy. I particularly wanted to come here because this is something that's been on my mind. And what concerns me is that, that we'll come up against economics no matter what we try mm. to do. And I think, you know, it'd be very, it's very difficult to tell an hourly paid lecturer to be resilient. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's it. That's just the, I'm afraid I have to go. But no, no, no thank you no. again. And it's it, therefore it's not. And the really important point there, that is um, victim blaming. It's about changing the systems and the processes and challenging them so that we don't have, you know, visiting lecturers on hourly paid contracts and uh, career. So it's but it's about it's about being strategic and being political and really putting the pressure on rather than putting it on them. I agree. Okay, nice to meet you. <laughs> Oh, yeah. um, Kevin from Kelp. Um, yeah, just thanks for the presentation. I um, really enjoyed it. Um, one of my like questions would be around, I think you mentioned active research and pedagogy and how it's demonstrated and applied in, you know, in the, the learning and teaching uh, forum. Um, we had the pleasure of meeting Dr. Theo Gilbert, who oh, yeah, yeah, uh, worked yeah. a lot around compassion, and he spoke about some strategies within the classroom, how you can you know, adopt certain uh, tasks and raise the awareness of compassion, but that was at quite a high level across the institution. Um, I'd like to know more about your active research and projects and, and how they kind of adopted yeah, strategies. It's interesting, to, Theo will be on the panel discussion next Thursday morning, so he was on the call yesterday. Um, and we know each other, we've begun to know each other quite well just through our shared interest. And we also don't always agree um, because Theo talks about the, the kind of micro skills of compassion with students in groups. Um, whereas I, as a work and organisational psychologist, so the last point I made is you've also got to change the root causes. 
and therefore you have to kind of take action. So we did action, an action learning set, but an action learning, um, sorry, an action, an action research, collaborative action research project. I'm retiring next year, so I'm not putting in any more, any more big grants or anything like that. But I think there's re particularly working with students as co-researchers, equal thinking partners, and the bit for me, which is about helping our role is students have got a lot of power. The NSS has got a lot of power um, and numbers have got a lot of power. But how do we work with students to help them think about themselves as learners with power and how they can use that, how we can use that power together? So I think, you know, some some good collaborative action learning, res action research or collaborative participatory action research would be a really good way, a really good way of doing that. Um, so, yeah, the, the, the disagreements that Theo and I have is that to what extent can micro skills in the classroom, unless you've got some, and he agrees with this, some systemic change and some really strong clout and leadership and money behind the changes. Um, and also then if you, the, the bit about compassion has got to be genuine. So my kind of slight fear is that if students realise now I'm going to be cynical, which is I'm just going to completely contradict myself in terms of trust. But if students know if they score highly on the rubric in relation to compassion for the group work that they've done. Um, so Theo made a comment yesterday when they've looked at a module that they've been done. There were more two ones in that particular cohort that had done that. So, yes, their, their grades were bigger. But I suppose the, the counter to that is if you look at the research, which I'll send you by somebody called Egan et al. It's just come out where they looked at um, students that were doing undergraduate social work and education who had an average age of 30. So slightly you know, more mature students in a kind of professional education. And they did various measures of resilience, compassion, self-compassion, procrastination, whatever, at the beginning of the year, and then correlated those with average grades at the end of the year and students that scored more highly on self-compassion and mindfulness had correlated more higher average grades. Students that scored lower on self-compassion but higher on self-criticism had lower than average grades. And I think they had, a, I forget how many in the cohort that they had, but I thought that was quite interesting about helping students to be kind to themselves and realise that actually we don't always do fantastically well at everything that we do um, and sometimes we learn more from failure even though it's a really hard lesson at the time um, and also the final thing is also that, that sometimes we do need to give hard messages so when I was head of psychology um, we had one particular student and who just really wanted to do psychology and they'd spent before I got there as head of psychology they'd run out of time They'd, they'd run, they'd done their seven years and the seven years had a, accumulated sufficient credit for um, level four. And just, it just wasn't for them. And I had to say, well, look, let's just look at the evidence. And anyway, is this really the right thing for you to be doing at the right time? And somebody made a comment on the call yesterday, which was um, if, particularly if you look at um, courses, say, for example, in medicine and in nursing and some universities, I don't know what it's like here. You can just keep retaking something until you, until you pass. Not all universities do that, obviously. Um, and I remember saying to somebody when I was an external examiner who had, and I would be, you can let people have six attempts and they're doing a healthcare course. Would you let them have six attempts at making a drug calculation until they got it right? I mean, you're, you're kind of smiling. Um, there are some times when you have to have the what I call being ruthless with compassion, like the breaking bad news, um, rather than make trying to, you know, for some people it, it, it is, it's like the breaking bad news, but you have to do it with compassion. That example, I thought it's, it is compassionate to be honest with that person, mm. isn't it? I mean, they, you're, you're helping them really, mm. because they're going to struggle yeah. if they don't, if they're not aware of that. And, you know, you don't want to entertain it. Yeah, and, and it, of course it's like, you know, that importance of giving honest but constructive and helpful feedback. What in, you know, 
in, in kind of family life, you know, people talk about home truths. My sister's staying with me and she's given me a few home truths. Um, but, so, but you think, OK, I don't want to hear that. But actually, maybe, you know, so being honest and trustworthy and genuine is really important. And, and, and knowing that it's not going to be easy and not every you can't have a one size blanket fits all. Um, and therefore, the bit about that I put in, in the kind of blurb is it's very it'll be very easy at this tipping point for compassion to be slotted into institutional values or slotted into um, a politician's speech just to try it as a window dressing. But if what, what's underneath, which is where the Edgar Schein, it's the Edgar Schein model is sometimes talked about as, a, as an iceberg. So if, if the tip of the iceberg um, doesn't reflect what's going on underneath, um, that's where you, you know you have to look at the, the, the need for compassion and the why and address the underlying discontents and harms. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And I will I will send to Melissa um, the link to the paper about action learning as a vehicle for compassion. Um, which is really very powerful, and also the, the one about the correlation with self-compassion and averages. Thanks. And genuinely, if, any, if anybody wants to discuss any ideas or just have a, a follow-on conversation, then just drop me an email. I work Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, because then I'll be retiring next year, but I will be staying on in an emeritus position, so it might take me a little while to, to get back to anybody, but I genuinely, because you don't always have these spaces to have these conversations um so be honest and if you notice the compassion chasm of which there are lots you can either say to people whoa watch your step don't go there um or give some feedback um thanks okay sorry thank you thank you okay i'm going to stop the recording so yeah yeah gonna ask I'll finish my sandwich. Yeah. 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 Yeah.